Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian. This recording takes place at Gertrude's writing room, thanks to poet and proprietor Vanessa Shields for making the space available. So our featured guest today is Veronique Mandel. Veronique has had a long and celebrated career, having won many local, provincial, national, and international awards for her work in both radio and print journalism, including but not limited to Ontario Journalist of the Year, Windsor Woman of the Year, and the Queen's Jubilee Medal. She currently coordinates and teaches full-time in the Journalism and Media Convergence programs at St. Clair College in Windsor, and she is the host of the show Scribes and Songsters on your TV. Veronique is also a successful author, writing both fiction and nonfiction books, including The Pink Hat in 2012 and Chasing Lightning in 1999, a book she co-authored with her husband, veteran journalist Chris Vanderdolen. Her latest book, Getting Off, which details the rise, fall, and redemption of the legendary late Windsor lawyer Don Tate was recently recognized as a finalist in the 2019 Best Book Awards sponsored by American Book Fest. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Between your professional role at St. Clair College, hosting your own show, and your extensive volunteerism in the community, how do you carve out time uh, to do your writing? If, um, I think if I had a, a really sensible answer for that, uh, I could make a fortune. Uh, <laughs> um, what I find is I do a lot of writing in my head. So, so for instance, or in, in my head when I'm doing stuff, but not when I have to concentrate on a lot of stuff. So, for instance, I can go out on my bike and... Around my block is 10 kilometers. So during that 10 kilometers, I can visualize a whole chapter or at least a whole segment of something I want to write. And as long as when I come back, I sit down, I can spend three hours and almost write word for word what I had in my head. It's a really peculiar uh, way to do it. And sometimes if I sit down and I think, okay, I, um, I have to write, I've got half an hour, I have to write, I'll think about everything except what I want to write. And then other times, if I'm, I'm rarely in a bad mood, but if I get in a bad mood and I go and sit down, I find I can write. But if I'm in a really sort of great um you know, um, um, everything's right with the world and Pollyanna mood. I want to do other stuff. So uh, being active and sort of being a little bit down Hmm. um, are, are sort of those two occasions when I find that I can really knock it out. Hmm. And I write poetry better when... I'm not in the best mood. So I don't know. I think I'm a bit weird. I don't (laughs) think so. I think that's fairly common for some people is that, you know, sort of negative feelings put you in the headspace to write, you know. Maybe Mm -hmm. it makes you focus up better. I don't Mm -hmm. know. But but I think that's relatively common that you're so if you're down or you're a little bit angry, that that's a really good time to just write it out, you know. (laughs) So And, And maybe that when I ride my bike, and as I said, it's when I'm, going around my block and my block is in the county and there's just nature just me and often I don't encounter one car one other person and so you know your head can go somewhere and I don't need to pay attention so uh, occasionally when that's happened and a car all of a sudden honks I mean I nearly go over my bike but because it becomes so concentrated, and 
one time after my mum died and I was really struggling and it was actually it was several years after she had died and I was still really struggling and I couldn't figure out how I was ever going to get past th this deep-seated grief and so I went out on my bike and I was I, I had mo I had had mum on my mind all night and I was really so down and I thought I said oh god I've got to find a way to put her somewhere in my heart where I'm not dying of grief and as I'm pedaling I began to think of my mom's life and the kind of pioneer life she had to live in this tiny little village in Newfoundland and I began to write the story of her life and by the time I came back I probably had 40% of it written in my head so I went upstairs and I sat down and I think it was the most prolific I ever I have ever been and but <laughs> the unfortunate thing is that's all I've written mm. so it helped me deal with, with the grief and I keep thinking I've got to get back to it because she really did have quite an extraordinary life. Wow. Hmm. Very cool. Well, writing for journalism and writing a book like get, Getting Off require the use of different mental muscles. How do the two processes work for you? How do they differ and how do they work together? You know, there are two things about that. One is that it works really well and the other is that it's a tremendous challenge because writing as a journalist means that you don't waste words you have you know the editing process in journalism is so rigorous and you if you have space for 15 words you're not doing 16 and so I always and I say this to my students which is something that I pay attention to myself it's writing cleverly it's not just shortening words or taking words out. It's rewriting so that the sentence is really good. So in that regard, I find that I can write very economically but put everything in. On the other side, poetry has helped me in being able to take that other um, um, type of writing. You know the getting away from those short declarative sentences that we use in broadcasting and that type of writing to being able to write sort of that descriptive narrative and making sure that you create that full bodied story and creating full bodied sentences and so I had to do to work at it a lot but feature writing helped um, as well. So if I take my training in news writing and training in feature writing and marry them, I can write something like getting off. So extended columns is, is what you're referring to with the feature writing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and writing, I often did series of stories where I had to um, you know, tell a lot of human stories over a period of time, and that helped as well, because the tendency is sort of once you've been immersed in journalism for thirty years, is to sort of write everything in that very journalistic style, and that's something I work at. I have to work at. How do you prepare differently for projects in those two different kinds of writing? A lot of the, uh, the first thing, the research is very similar. The way you set up, so if I have to do it, write a news story, I think of the most important thing, the whole, um, you know, um, inverted pyramid. And think of who's going to tell the story at the top of the uh, inversion. and and then everything that I got to put in the body whereas writing either feature writing or writing um, getting off that uh, type of writing 
you don't necessarily start at the top of the inverted pyramid. You might start three quarters down and that's where you're, you enter. But it's very difficult to enter a news story because then your lead gets buried and people are reading and reading your story and eventually they come to the main point of the story. Whereas I think with feature writing and novel, writing novels, it really doesn't matter where you enter as long as you're bringing people in and you keep them. So it's almost a juxtaposition. And I, I often think this kind of writing, uh, novel writing, is almost hourglass or three or four hourglasses where, you know, you might... You might start at the middle of the hourglass and then it expands out, but it's rare that you start at the top of the in inversion in the pyramid. And, and I, I try to use that when I'm deciding how I'm getting into a feature story. It's which part of that hourglass needs to sort of be there first. So and in some ways, it's, it's um, a difficult training and it's a difficult thing to get your head around. So, uh, you know, it's something that I work on a lot. And I read, 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 read other people's wonderful work. So this biography that you've written has a really clever title. Getting mm -hmm. off can refer to Don Tate's passion for getting his legal clients acquitted, but it can also refer to his getting off on his various addictions and high-risk behaviors and challenges and so on. At what point in the writing process did you decide on that title, and how easy or difficult was it to choose? It was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> Titles are hard. Mm. Um, I had 34 titles for this book and I ran them all by Dawn and this one was number 31 <laughs> <laughs> and so I read this one and then I went on to the other two Dawn says go back go back to the sec the third the one that just before just before <laughs> so I read the second last one he says no that's not the one and then I read getting off and he said that's it and he said do you have anything else to go with it? I said, well, I actually said A Criminal Lawyer's Road to Redemption. I said, actually, that's one of the titles, A Criminal Lawyer's Road to Redemption. And he said, well, that alone is pretty boring, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and then I ran it by my husband. And so he said, didn't I think of that one? And I said, no, no, you didn't. <laughs> because we had brainstormed a lot of titles. And so Don thought that for him, it epitomized everything that was in his life. And he said, I can't imagine another title that would actually be more demonstrative of my life. He said, my whole life is about getting off on getting my, and he said the very thing, getting off, getting my clients off. And he said, getting off on, you know, having wealth and spending and drugs and alcohol and women. And he said, if there are two words that describe me, it's probably getting off. <laughs> so the innuendo was not lost on <laughs> him <laughs> either, clearly. <laughs> and that's wonderful, the, the, um, the trust that you have and the rapport that, that you obviously have, which leads us to, um, it's sort of very, your biography is very detailed with his highs and lows in his life um, and his spiritual awakening and his, his search for redemption and, and new purpose. So, um, so this trust built up and, and obviously it came right to the point of the title. Was there a, an aha moment when you knew that you had sort of gained Dawn's trust to go forward with all of these, uh, this information? In the book, I detailed that process of once, once the editors in all of the newsrooms began saying to all of us, find Dawn Tate. I mean... I really did not like Don Tate, and the day that my editor made me, forced me, uh, browbeat me into going over to interview him, this was when, after the incident 
with his girlfriend um, up on Lake Huron. And everybody was saying Don Tate's off the wagon, and Don was protesting he wasn't. So he called the editor and said, look, I want to set this, the record straight. I'm not off the wagon, and blah, blah, blah. And I was the only person left in the newsroom. And so the uh, editor said to me, could you go over? And I said, no. And he said, well, I really need someone to go. And I said, that wouldn't be me. I'm the health reporter, and right now, I'm working on four stories that you want over the next five days. So, no, that's not me. And anyway, um, in the end, I didn't want to aggravate him enough to fire me, so I thought I'd better go. So I went over to interview Don already with a mindset that, you know, this jerk is sort of eating into the time I need to be doing my own job. And so I go in, and um, we're, he's showing me around, and he wanted to show me every nook and cranny of his house, and because he was very proud of it, you know. And anyway, we get to his office and in the house, and we're sitting down, and um, so I'm asking him questions and taking notes, and then at one point, I asked him a question, and he didn't answer. So I looked up. He said, you don't like me very much, do you? I said, I have no feelings for you one way or the other. I said, I was sent over here. I said, no, I was forced to come over here to interview you. So I said, that's what I'm doing. Now, ask them the question. And that was the end of it. And I thought, that's the last time I'm probably ever going to lay eyes on Don Tate. And, and there was another incident when I was at CBC where I was forced to have to... Uh, do something that involved Don Tate that really aggravated me. So I, I didn't have a good track record mentally. And um, and then about a month or two later, I was walking downtown and I saw this guy that looked like Don Tate, but he looked really awful. And he did not want to sort of, I, I was trying to get a look at him, but he was not having it. And I thought, oh, well, whatever. And it was, so then um, when the editors put out, the, when he, you know, he um, disappeared and all that was going on, for some ungodly reason, I mean, I still often try to figure out why it was that I had that feeling, I'm going to find Don Tate it was like it was preordained, honest to God. So I went over to Christopher, who was sitting across the newsroom, and I said, you're looking at the reporter who's going to find Don Tate. So he said, yeah, okay, sweetheart. And he laughed. I said, don't sweetheart me. I'm going to find Don Tate. He said, you don't even like Don Tate. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I know, but I don't know. I'm going to find Don Tate. And so... It started, and I tell you, um, I, all the unsavory characters that I knew Don was acquainted with were the first ones I targeted. And then, one day, I get a phone call from Don's daughter, and she said, uh, I hear you're looking for me, because I've been asking some of these characters if they ever saw uh, Melanie to let me know. And so anyway, we met for coffee, and on the f fourth time we met, she brought me this thick file, and she said, um, my dad wants you to have the file. And because up to then, I would just subtly say, well, if, you're, if your dad ever wants to talk to anybody, tell him, you know, I wouldn't mind. Anyway, when the day that that file landed on that table in the coffee shop, I just thought, I think he wants me to talk to him. And so two days later, might have been a week, the phone rings in the newsroom, and Chris and I are the only two reporters in the newsroom. Chris picks it up, and then my phone rings, and 
I'm saying hello, this is Veronique, and this voice says, hey kid, it's Tate. And I said, Tate? Tate? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my God. At the same time, Christopher comes over and he's holding the phone and he's got his hand over the mouthpiece and he's saying, I've got Don Tate's daughter on the phone. And I said, i got Don Tate on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> We had, we talked for hours, I bet three, four hours. And then I kept saying to him, this is all on record. I'm taking notes. I'm recording. This is all on record. And he kept saying, yes, yes, yes. And at the end, I said to him, okay, so I'm going to print with this tomorrow. He says, no, you're not. And I said, I've, been, I've said 50 times this is on the record. And he said, sure. But he said, that's not the end of the story. He said, you have to come and uh, visit me. So I said, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, Costa Rica. Wow. And so I knew then that there was um, some kind of a relationship. Whatever that was, uh, there was some trust that he decided in me. I mean, who would think when I treated him so offhandedly and badly, really. I mean, I was more contemptuous of him, and I tried not to be because I don't like to be contemptuous of people. But he was really getting on my nerves. And for him to have sent that to me, I thought, there must be some reason. And then the, when I got to Costa Rica, when I was leaving, I just offhandedly, and he would cried during this interview, and it was really quite sad and pathetic and I thought there's something quite likable about this sort of degenerate man there is there's something more to him than what we've all seen and I felt really sorry for him and so I remember walking away and I turned and looked at him and I said hey Tate I said if you happen to survive this, as in the chances are not good, but I said, if you do, and you ever want a biography written, I said, give me a call. And I thought, why did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I thought, I don't have to worry about him anymore. And I never thought I'd have to. But those two incidents, the, the folder from Melanie that day, and especially the look on his face when I was leaving, I thought, oh, that's, it's so weird. And so, but I put him out of my mind, you know, because I thought, he's too complicated. And then, five years later, the phone rings, and I run upstairs, and I pick it up and say, hello, it's Veronique. And he says, hey, kid, it's Tate. So I just said, Tate who? Thinking T-A-T-E somebody. <laughs> and I said, Tate who? And he says, how many Tates do you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I recognized his voice. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning. Wow. And then we talked every Sunday for two years. Wow. And then 11 years after that phone call, the book. It's amazing. You know, and then three... Um, three trips to South Africa because I didn't he was telling me all this stuff for two years and I mean I'm a journalist I'm supposed to just believe everything he's telling me <laughs> and uh, so because I, I kept then I, I started to be a little more prickly about the questions and he said you don't believe me and I said well come on Tate I said you're in South Africa and I'm here I said you can tell me that it's snowing in Durban, and I wouldn't know. Anyway, he said, I guess you're going to have to come. And I thought, well, I, there's two good things about that. I would get to see if what he's saying is really the truth, and I wouldn't mind a trip to South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary courage on your part to, uh, to go into that initial interview all by yourself this you know, a fellow with it, such a reputation. And it, then to sort of abandon yourself in the middle of Costa Rica and South well, Africa. You know, you know, that I often think about that now. 
I mean, I never gave it a thought. To me, I was going to get the story of the year, and I was. I went. I, I, they didn't send a photographer with me. They always send photogs if you're going out of town, and they didn't even do that. I had to negotiate with a guy in Costa Rica who didn't speak a word of English, and I spoke about nine words of Spanish. And I still, you know, didn't sort of think. And it was only when I was on the plane coming back that I thought... I'm certifiable. <laughs> I'm truly certifiable. Like, who in their right mind does this? And I thought, well, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> and even Marty Benito, you know, even years later, he used to say to me, I still can't believe we did that, that we sent you off there <laughs> by yourself. And who knew what I was going to find? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, Don Tate was pretty volatile. Mm -hmm. And you never knew. Yeah. What was uh, what was coming, and uh, but you know, do you know? Do you ever sort of think sometimes you're just destined to do stuff, and even though it, and it almost gets out of your control. And I always, I almost felt like there was a train that I was on uh, with this with Don Tate, and that whole trajectory was taking me somewhere. And I used to say to Christopher sometimes when I would, if six or seven months would go by, or maybe three or four, and I wouldn't write a word. And I used to think, maybe this is just going to die a death. And I, Christopher used to say, are you afraid? Like, what is it? And I said, I don't know. I feel like I'm being pulled along, and I want to stop it. And then Tate would call, and he was quite remarkable in that way, and he would say to me, if you don't want to do this, he said, there's no hard feelings on, on my side. He said, if it's not meant to be, it won't happen. But he said, I get the feeling that you have moments when you think you just want to stop. And I thought, this is too weird. Mm -hmm. So I would get going again. <laughs> and I had three big glottal stops like that. Mm -hmm. And then, but the last seven months it was as though the train picked up speed and his getting cancer those last seven months where he suffered physically almost more than anyone I've ever witnessed over a long period of time and not once did he ever say to me that he felt bad that you know that he was hurting. I could hear. We talked at least twice a month on a Sunday, and I could hear the terrible pain in his throat. And I'd say to him, how's your throat? Oh, he said, about as good as it can be. And so one day he said to me, how are you feeling? And I said, well, this, and I've got a sore throat, and I've, you know, got sinus infection, and I'm going on and on. And I suddenly stopped. And I said, okay, what's wrong with you? I said, I've, I'm not nearly suffering an iota close to you. And I'm complain I've been complaining for the last 10 minutes. And you tell me that your throat's as good as it can be. And then every time I said that, he would say, don't forget, I brought this on myself. Hmm. And he would never say that he was hurting. So there were many extraordinary moments like that that made me realize that there was so much more to Don and his spiritual awakening. It was a lot of BS at the beginning, I believe, but it really did grow into a true spiritual en uh, enlightenment. And he became one of the most spiritual uh, people I've ever, ever talked to. And he did help me when I ran into a physical problem and I was dying. And every all the conversations that I'd had with him about death and dying, it really helped me. And when I survived and 
we went to Africa about five or six months later, I was able to talk to him about that whole side of him in a way that I couldn't before. And that near death of mine allowed me to write the last third of that book in a way I could never have written it had that not happened to me. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate to have to nearly die, but I was, I was so glad in the end because that last third, I think, was the most important part of the book because I think it shows anyone who has these severe addictions, anyone whose life is so out of control that they lose a sense of themselves that there's always a redemption. There can be a, a redemption. And, uh, and I, in the end, the book probably saved my life mm. because the one thing I learned from all of this was the fact that I uh, was a terrible, uh, I had a terrible work addiction. Mm. I mean, I used to leave my house at quarter to seven in the morning and come home 11, 12 o'clock every night, every week. And I, everybody was saying, used to say to me, you're on a bad path. And I would not have stopped. And so, you know, it's interesting. I never thought that writing this book about Don Tate would have had an impact on my life. And I think I became a much more spiritual person because of that. You're very present in the book. I mean, it's, it's, it's unusual in a way because you are presenting the story of Don Tate from childhood to the end of his life, really. But, but you're very much present, and it's sort of about your reactions to things and your motivations and the discoveries you were making along the way, uh, personally and professionally. Was there any kind of struggle for you in terms of how much of yourself to insert into the book? I'm so glad you asked that because... Up until the last iteration of the book, and I, I think I did about 13 rewrites, I had nothing of me. And then the next one, but it was really clunky because you've got this reporter, and so much of what happened was based on what happened to that reporter. And so a couple of iterations, I was using... A reporter and I created a character and that was Don he, uh, he hit the ceiling he said this is stupid <laughs> <laughs> he said who's going to believe that <laughs> and he said putting yourself in the third person just sounds stupid <laughs> so um, then I let a couple of other people read the book and a couple of really trusted um literary people and I got the same reaction from them that this won't work if you don't take if you're not the thread through the book and so I tried to keep me out of it as much as possible because I was uncomfortable from the beginning I'm a journalist and you, I don't you don't put yourself in your work and that was, uh, that was probably the hardest challenge of all. And I took out probably 50% of what was originally in there. And I left, I thought, what would take the story, sort of show how what happened to this reporter allowed this book to to actually happen and if I had not gone to Costa Rica I don't know where this story would have gone and because I was the only one who knew what happened in Costa Rica and what happened there was the foundation of the book hmm. so it was really difficult and I'm still uncomfortable with it in some ways but I th now the, the last um, iteration was also based on uh, one of the people who reviewed it who said it's important for us to know if this had any effect on you did, did this matter to you and 
so that's why I had to say that yes, this did have a profound effect on me, in a, um, and in a way I never dreamed. For our listeners, could you just give us a really short synopsis of what happened in Costa Rica that was the foundation? It was the first time that I believe anyone actually saw Don Tate as the real person. He was so far gone in his alcoholism that he had friends in Costa Rica he would never have given the time of day when he was Don Tate, the criminal lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I saw that boy when he was 16 years old, and I thought, there is an extraordinary human inside this big bloated body, and this bravado had changed. It was now, he was complimenting the, these friends who came from very meager backgrounds. And he was, there was a, he was, he was always a kind man, but there was always something in it for Don. But this time, there was nothing in it. I mean, he just was a derelict gringo. And if I had not seen that man, I would never have written a story about Dante the way we all knew him because I had no interest in him whatsoever. But that human I saw in Costa Rica, I couldn't believe that that man was inside that awful body and that there was truly a deeper man we'd never we'd never seen so that made a big difference yeah. All right. so um, Kate passed away in 2019 you were able to publish the book while he was still living why was it so important to you to finish that in his lifetime what did you want him to see the thing that occupied the latter part of uh, Don's life was a true commitment and desire to help, to help people. And, I mean, he, he made no money. I can tell you, if anybody thinks that Don Tate had money living in Africa, they better dispel it, because he, he had very little. Don Tate did not go out for dinners, well he couldn't eat anyway, but I mean he did nothing. The only thing he did was watch television and counsel people and no matter how ill he was, he went to the Cedars for his counseling sessions. And he kept saying to me, I don't mind if you don't do it, I don't care if, you know, it never gets written, but if you think you still want to do it, could you do it while I'm still alive? Because he said, if there were people who read it and they want to come to Cedars, he said, that would be really, really important. And people did. Wow. People came from all over the world. And so he, because he'd asked, I thought, I have to get my rear end in gear. And that's why the last seven months I really, really pushed and focused solely on getting this out because he used to tell me all the time, you have to prepare yourself. I'm nearing the end of my life. And I used to say to him, come on, Tate, you've got to hang on. Um, I don't want to publish the book bef you know, before you're dead. And he said, you don't realize, he said that, my time is limited. He said, what I've done to myself is means that I'm not going to be around for, for a long time. And so I said, I made a promise, and I kept it. That is the mother of all deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> so, Veronik, what is your next project? Um, I have three. Um the Chief Nursing Officer of Ontario has asked me to write the story of what happened to me 
and my near death for a couple of reasons. One, because it really is um, a wake-up call for women and who think that they can do it all with no consequences. And the other is the experience that I had as a nurse and um, knowing that I was dying and what the reaction that I had from medical staff, nursing and, and medical staff, because nobody ever came and said to me, how, how are you feeling? Like, what are you thinking? Are you scared? Are you worried? I'm, I'm grateful they were focused on saving my life, but I was alone. Like, it was just me and God. And I mean, that was good, but it would have really been nice for somebody to come and say, would you like to talk? And so I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to write that. And the other is the, my mother's story. And I think I'm going to create a stage play rather than a book. Mm. Oh, wow. And I have, so some years ago, I had a musical that was produced at the Capitol Theater. And so I'm writing the screenplay of that. And I want to go home to Newfoundland and actually film it in Newfoundland where it's based. Oh, fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for this amazing insight into your, your life and your work. And we look forward to the next project. Come and talk to us when that happens. Oh, thank you so much. I feel so honored that no. uh, you had me on. I really do. Three extraordinary talented women. I mean, it doesn't get any better. Thank yeah. you. Oh, thank you. Thank so you. Much. I got you. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.